Welcome everybody, I'm Dr. Bob Brakey, the head of the IHA Lifestyle Medicine Institute. I uh, appreciate your joining us this uh, beautiful summer morning. Uh, we've got a great uh, session for you. Uh, and as we think about the pillars of lifestyle medicine, uh, some are pretty obvious. Uh, the nutrition, um, it's important to sleep, uh, exercise, keep moving. But one that's sort of less obvious is connectivity. Um, why is it important that we connect with each other that, as Dean Ornish says, love more and, and stress less. In fact, in his recent book, Undo It, uh, Dean calls connectivity the most important pillar of lifestyle medicine. Uh, and again, as you know, Dean Ornish, sort of the father of, of lifestyle medicine, um, carries a lot of influence here. And, and, and why would he say that? Um, and a, a good part of the reason is that connectivity really brings us the ability to and, and experience and stick with all the others as well. Uh, people that are socially connected, and this goes way back, and I know Anne's gonna cover this, um, are more likely to stick with good eating, to, to carry forward with their exercise routines, to, to get good quality sleep. Uh, and so in, in many ways, this is the most important of the pillars. Uh, we commonly tease each other about which is really most important. Uh, but this morning, we're going to cover that one, which may seem a little bit more nebulous, but will come into focus for us. And, and without um, further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker this morning. Dr. Ann Dorenwend is a, a, a professional health coach and, and resilience and connection uh, with uh, St. Joe's Mercy Health System. Uh, she helps residents and physicians to um, experience and find mm -hmm. that which will help them uh, to both connect and, and, and work their way through uh, the often stressful uh, experience of being a provider in today's day and age. Uh, so, uh, Anne, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, we appreciate your sharing your wealth of experience and, and stories that may go along with this. Uh, and, and I know Anne has told me, too, she wants to keep this interactive. So feel free to raise your hand or put a comment or question in the chat box, even during her, her talk. Uh, and, uh, of course, we'll have time at the end as well uh, to um, share our own uh, stories of connectivity and how this will help us to um, experience all the best life has to offer. Uh, if you're not speaking, please uh, mute yourself uh, and uh, Anne, take it away and uh, feel free to augment the introduction in any way you'd like to as well. Thank you. Hey, Bob, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Perfect. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Wow. A Microsoft, Microsoft miracle for me um, as an Apple user. Good morning, everybody, early birds, um, and thanks for coming. So my goal here, you know, when people, when they ask me to do a talk on connection, there's a million possible angles I could take. Uh, it, it, it's a bit, it was a bit dumbfounding of where to begin. So I decided to frame the discussion around a connection across the lifespan using, if you're familiar with Eric Erickson, um, using that as a, as, a, as a framework, Eric Erickson stages of psychosocial development. So here we go. Oh, and the main thing too is I really want this to be about you guys talking. And I figure if you get up at this time in the morning for, for a, a lecture, you're, gonna, you're the kind of person who's gonna jump in and, and engage. So um, I hope that you will, you will do that. I'll, I'll signal you in. Um, so, uh, lifestyle medicine and COVID, um, I'm just starting the, with a reminder of the different pillars of lifestyle medicine, which I think you're probably all familiar with. Uh, and we know that during COVID, higher odds of both mortality and severity of COVID-19 are closely related to unhealthy behaviors. And what you're going to find is that isolation for some folks is tied to unhealthy behaviors. The goal is to really reflect this morning. I want to give you guys an opportunity to slow down and think about connection. Honestly, I think the reflection is much more important than any facts that, I, that I'm gonna share with you. So that's truly my focus here. So uh, what is the psychological impact of connection versus isolation? And then to get you to think about how you connect. 
So let's start with a slideshow. I'm going to go slowly through this slideshow. And what I'm going to do is, and, and this is to get you thinking about connection across the lifespan. So can you guys grab a sheet of paper? I saw some of you outside. Um, but if it's possible to grab a sheet of paper and uh, make this little chart. Um, as we go through the slides, what I'd like you to do is to just jot down what types of connection you notice and is there a need or a purpose in the connection? So I'll give you a second to, to get that type of connection and need or purpose related to the connection. Bob, you think people have enough time to grab something? Yep, I think we're good. Okay, so here we go.
Okay. So Bob, here's where I'm going to ask you to jump in. Please use chat and also raise your hand to talk about what are the types of connection that you saw across the lifespan. Anybody feel free to unmute yourself, turn on your video. Or any that, that weren't there that just you thought about as you were watching. And for me, I see uh, not only across the lifespan, like temporally, but across the globe, like um, geographically uh, and across the disciplines like uh, theology or science or um, where we are in our um, careers, our way of thinking and Connections, uh, I think, are influenced by so many different aspects of what, where we are in, in our lifespan, where we are in our um, areas of concern for security or, or uh, fears. Um, and all of this kind of ties into the emotions of being human. Um, I don't know, can you talk a little about how it's it's not just a unidirectional, but sort of multifaceted approach to connection. Sure. Um, I want to give folks a little more time to respond. Anybody out there with types of connection? And the other question is, what did you notice about the, was there a need or purpose? Any noted things that you noticed there? Any chat, any raise hands? Jump in, folks. You don't want to just hear me. Jennifer says sports, religion, uh, co-workers, uh, politics. Kelly uh, says family, friends, education, social media, arts, entertainment, politics, social justice, uh, church, religion, emotional, spiritual, physical connections. Again, feel free to also unmute yourself or Turn on your video and. What about needs? Anybody um, in terms of psychosocial development? And maybe that's a heavy question for this time in the morning. Oh, uh, what I did notice this, sorry, this is uh, Jerry's Peoples. I'm sorry, say again. Jerry's from Mercy Women's Mercy Women's Center. Hi. Yes, Hi. go ahead, Jerry's. Uh, what I did notice uh, this looking at the slides was the need of connection uh, through uh, culture. I saw a lot of different uh, slides of culture and just bringing traditions together that um, all cultures and certain cultures share. And uh, some of that can be even through uh, food. And, and that could be a culture uh, thing that brings people together. Okay. Thank you. So this is uh, David Steinberger. How are you doing, Ann? Hi, Dave. And, you know, I saw a lot of, you know, I, as you went through the different sections, I, I saw a lot of connections like family. You started with children. Next, avocations is what I called the next one. And they all did different things. So, so you know, you had one of religion and, you know, I called that faith and it brings, it brings comfort. The ones of society uh, bringing belonging um, the um, mm -hmm. uh, travel, just just for fun and discovery, uh, mm -hmm. many many things. The the last slides, uh, you know, I kind of said past and history, and and looked at at wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that's kind of what I was doing as you were going through it. Thank you. So you're hitting on a lot of the um, the needs met. You know, pass the the wisdom, passing on wisdom, um, and uh, um, and the universe, 
mindfulness. Yeah. You, know, you had those pictures of of um, of the just our our existence and and so. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I I I. I just don't want to cut anybody off if people are thinking. Sometimes it takes a little while to chew on it. Jennifer says physical needs like a hug. Uh, Angela says mother-child bond, security and love, relationship bond, togetherness and belonging, religion, purpose and values. Uh, Teresa says kids needing parents for love, support and fun. And then lovers uh, sharing love and need to love each other throughout their lifespan. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So any last thoughts before I go ahead? Any other chats coming through, Bob? That's all for now. Okay. So you guys, you know, talked about everything. I think you use the same language. Um, you know, we, we connect as individuals, both to the past and the present. Um, we connect um, as groups uh, in our identity development and shared beliefs and shared goals. Um, we connect in different ways. We connect on, on a larger plane as uh, identifying as countries and for good or bad races uh, is, a, is a term used sometimes, um, religions, cultures. And, uh, and the questions, the big, big sort of existential questions of, you know, uh, of connection. Are we alone in the, in the universes? Um, is there a God? Is there a loving creator is, is, is it, 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 that I uh, make a connection to? Um, so what does psychology tell us? Well, connectivity is a key to health. Um, authentic social interactions, even brief ones, even brief ones, you know, that conversation you have on the plane with somebody that's, that's more intimate than you expected and that stays with you. Um, they count too. These positively affect longevity and health. <clears throat> Healthy social connection, as Bob was talking about earlier, Healthy social connections are the single most important predictor of happiness and longevity. And, you know, there's a lot of talk now about purpose and gratitude. Those are, you know, two uh, vitamins du jour for uh, happiness. Um, and and um, they both are about connection. Um, connection is critical to survival. It activates the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, lowering stress and its hazardous consequences. So I want to frame um, what's, what's going to follow um, with Eric Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. So this may bring you back to your Psych 100 class. Um, you know, I've been around uh, doing this a long time, and I, I still often think about Eric Erickson um, when I'm interacting with people and trying to meet psychological needs. I'm always asking, what does this person need right now in their development? And um, so very, very quickly, you, you go from, as an infant, the, the challenge is, uh, do you have trust or mistrust? of people. Again, the, the, every one of these is in a social context, even if it's not at first obvious to you. Um, shame and doubt versus autonomy. Well, how does that happen when you take action, when you begin to exercise choice? Is that applauded by the social uh, forces around you, your parents, most importantly, at that stage? Or is, it, is there shame associated with their reaction? Um, preschoolers, can I take initiative or do I have guilt if I assert myself? Um, industry, I can be productive, do things well versus a sense of inferiority. And identity, you know, adolescence, um, and I'll mention this in a minute about the importance of peer and shaping identity, peer group. Um, so again, the social context of peer group, it becomes hugely important during adolescence. Um, and then intimacy. Uh, versus isolation. 
Um, and generativity uh, versus stagnation. And I'll explain generativity a little bit uh, further down the road, but basically it's about uh, passing on what you what passing on what you've learned in life um, to the next generation. Think of it as a handhold to the next generation, a connection to the future. And ego integrity um, versus despair. Uh, are you are you do you leave this life feeling like your life had purpose? So you can see when you when you look at it's psychosocial development for a reason, right? So how you develop as an individual is framed in the context of the, the society around you, the individuals around you. So um, I, I don't know if you're familiar. I know I'm taking it uh, going way back again, um, but this is uh, this is sort of very basic. Again, I could have gone all over the place with with if I could have picked any focus because connection is is an every is all over the place. It's unwieldy as a topic. Um, so it, what happened for me is I started to think about basics. So Harlow um, uh, did these monkey experiments and they really are about, this is where attachment theory was born. Um, so basically you saw what these, these this is the, the terry cloth mother. Um, and I don't have a picture of it, but he did an experiment with monkeys, terry cloth mothers, and the hard wire mother, which didn't have the terry cloth on her. And um, what Harlow found was that monkeys preferred the soft terry cloth surrogate to the hard wired surrogate, even when the terry cloth mother didn't provide nutrition. So, you know, a, a bottle is hooked up to the, the hard wire monkey and the monkeys would go there to get something to eat, but they would go to the terry cloth mother the rest of the time even though that was a dismal mom, just a bit of warm terry cloth, but it was better than nothing. And so when they were afraid, they clung to that terry cloth mom. And then he, he this is, by the way, there's been a lot of uh, questions ethically about these Harlow experiments, and it's actually quite painful uh, for me to think about what he did to these monkeys. But, um, uh, but uh, I think the results are, are worth talking about um, he isolated the monkeys at birth, so no contact with other monkeys. Um, and monkeys who had no social contact uh, for different periods of time, and it, it was worse for those after 90 days of isolation. Um, they were scared of other, when they were brought back in, uh, among a social environment, they were scared of other monkers, monkeys. They were aggressive, they were bullied, they self-mutilated, tearing up their hair, scratching biting their arms and legs. So, um, you know, clearly right from the get-go, um, we're wired with a need for connection. And that connection stays throughout our life. It, it changes, um, but, it, but the need for connection remains right from the umbilical cord to death. And of course we know, you know, it's not just Harlow's monkeys, um, isolation has been used in punishments, used in, in sol prisons, solitary confinement, um, some religions, shunning, uh, being ostracized. Uh, we know that teens who are ostracized, there's a high, for instance, a, a gay, gay youth, um, if, they, if folks come out early, they have increased risk of suicide ideation if they're not yet ready um, to... to uh, they don't yet have the resilience and the confidence, um, and they're ostracized. Uh, so in talking about families, let's glance at my time here. When we talk about families, the research is pretty clear that resilient families play an immensely important social role. Um, the healthy fa healthiest families um, have a positive outlook. Uh, there's some spirituality of some kind. Uh, and that, again, that may be God or connection with nature. Uh, there's family member core, people get along, flexibility, good family communication. Uh, the kids know there's financial management, not too much financial stress or chaos. Uh, there's family time spent together, shared recreation, routines and rituals. Uh, and support networks, you know, connecting with other families. So, um, 
you know, I always emphasize the importance of routines and rituals. Um, it, and they may be, for instance, my mom loves Star Trek. And uh, so we, when there were four of us and we would, Star Trek, we got to stay up late uh, back when the original Captain Kirk Star Trek was playing. So we would stay up late and the lights would go off and she would, we'd all be laying on the carpet and she'd come out with some kind of candy, I don't know, candy dots or something, popcorn. And, um, and, and that screen would light up ooh, and boy, was that joyful and ritual it, it cements it in memory. So when folks look back at their family, you know, what was Christmas like, what were birthdays like? Um, when I work with families, I often um, explore the family connectedness, family time, but especially family rituals and routines together. Um, we know the research is clear that families who eat dinner together, there's all kinds of positive sequelae that comes from that. Kids don't get in trouble as much. They don't have, they, they stay in school, all kinds of stuff you wouldn't think. Um, so uh, family plays a very, uh, obviously an important social role. It changes somewhat in adolescence between 10 and 24. A lot of people don't think adolescence is till 24, but you know that frontal lobe is slow to develop. And um, uh, anybody who has kids know that, you know, why didn't, why aren't you, you know, why did you put that there when we talked about you putting it here, you know, all these times. So frontal lobes, don't blame your kids for everything. Uh, they develop kind of, you know, into the early 20s. Um, those neural networks are still forming. Um, and uh, so um, during adolescence, there's a heightened sensitivity to social stimuli. I don't, I think you guys all know this increased need for peer interaction, increased importance of acceptance from peers. Family becomes less important, peers become more. Social deprivation in adolescence can have far reaching consequences. And I think it's worth noting um, that when initially uh, folks are looking at the impact of COVID and isolation during adolescence, this key time for peer contact. Um, and so far, uh, it, it looks like it may be less det detrimental than, than we first thought because of digital forms of so social connection. Um, my son keeps telling me, Mom, I, I'm, you know, I'm friends with people on, on my, you know, on, on my networks and, and, and my podcasts that I do and things like that. And, and it's so foreign to me. My mother said, get out of the house in the morning and come back when I scream out the door, come back dinner. And, you know, otherwise we were running around outside all day and nobody's watching us and we're social all the time. And so of course, I think that must be the way it should be for him. Um, and, and, and we know there's some negative uh, uh, consequences of too much screen time. That's a fact for sure. Um, but uh, there's also evidence on the other side too that um, there's true social connections that occur um, and that are that are meaningful um, on the internet for our kids. And maybe some of you uh, gamers out there, adult gamers. Um, I want to talk a minute. You saw some slides uh, showed the impact of social disconnect secondary to um, bigotry and discrimination, uh, racism, homophobia, all those isms. So I, I really like this quote from Pascal. Um, he said, <clears throat> Stigma, stigmatization and discrimination are sources of chronic stress that impact health. Autonomic arousal cause wear and tear in the body, which results in greater vulnerability to disease and psychological exhaustion. This in turn increases participation in unhealthy behaviors and decreases participation in healthy behaviors. And so if you, <clears throat> if you ask yourself, um, you know, why do minorities have um, access to care issues and uh, greater um, uh, proclivity for certain medical problems um, and even behaviors, smoking, uh, other types of things that certain minorities are, have a proclivity for, increased risk for, um, this explains it. Uh, so, you know, stress causes disease vulnerability, um, which, 
you know, all of these really should have arrows pointing toward each other as well. Um, decrease in healthy behavior, increase in unhealthy behavior, psychological exhaustion. Um, so there is a price to be paid when we divide people and treat them differently when we other them, when we disconnect with them psychologically. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this uh, was originally developed uh, by Cross to explain Black identity development, but now it's used for all minority development and minority identity development. And it's quite helpful in understanding um, the overlay between social, uh, psychosocial development and, and identity. So, you know, when, so this is a, a, a work that minorities do that majority population doesn't do. Um, and again, it's key to connection. It's all about social context. Um, we are minorities only in the sense that the society uh, tells us that we are less than. Um, our social context tells us we are less than. Otherwise, there would be no minority, psychological minority uh, um, pain. So there's confusion uh, initially, uh, you know, who am I? Uh, and then uh, I am different, I'm not, I'm the other. Uh, and then comparison to the uh, majority uh, uh, social group and uh, that sense of inferiority, uh, gaining, by the way, in, in confusion, there's often, uh, a, in comparison, there's often a sense of a buy-in that, that I am less than the majority, uh, the majority identity person. Um, and then there's tolerance, beginning to accept um, the self, uh, whether this, we're talking about, I, I, I am, um, uh, I should say, this is, it's, I'm trying to separate this out, but I am uh, gay and, and, and bi, I, I would identify as an, I'm married for uh, 24 uh, years and, and have a, a son. Um, so I, when I think about this, I often think about the context of, of, um, homosexual identity development, but um, uh, it really it, it is for everybody uh, in a minority status. But there's that sense of um, you know uh, struggling with your self acceptance, and then the sense of pride, and that's when you see people again. Social is so important here during acceptance phase of identity development. People dive deep; they immerse themselves in the identity culture, and that's often when you'll see people wearing. Um, pride t-shirts and um, rainbow jewelry and uh, et cetera, if you're gay, for instance. Um, and, um, and, and there's a real immersion. And then people sort of, uh, if, you, if you watched Ellen, again, I'm gonna use uh, my, my personal, uh, use a, an example from gay culture, but when Ellen uh, DeGeneres came in on TV, <clears throat> She goes up to the line to buy groceries and she has a melon and she's, oh my God, the melon, they must think this is like a, I think, you know, it's round like a boob or something. I don't remember exactly. And then, and then she asks for something and she, she imagines the person saying gay over the microphone when she asked for like, she didn't ask for gay, she asked for whatever, yogurt. And, and during that period of um, development, it seems like identity uh, of being gay or being black or being um, a woman or whatever is the most important part of self um, because that is what's trying to fight its way out of the shell and, and, and successfully integrate um, it, it with the culture, with the social group around. And, um, but then that starts to fade and then it becomes whatever that minority identity is, is a part of who you are, but it's maybe for some people it still might be high up on the list. Other people, it may sort of fade down um, and, and they may sort of, it, it takes a different shape and form, but you have to get through to synthesis. You have to get through all those steps for identity development to solidify. And so during synthesis, it, whatever your minor, minority status is, 
it's one more piece of your identity, but it's synthesized with all the other aspects of self because there's acceptance and love of self and not, no sense of inferiority. Um, so when you overlay that with uh, social, psychosocial development, you know, it's natural to see how um, identity, we, we see uh, there's identity smack in the middle of psychosocial development, but um, sense of inferiority, if you don't get through those stages as a minority, if you stay disconnected, both from self and culture, self and other, um, you see yourself as the other in the culture, in your social groups, um, there's going to be a sense of inferiority. Um, and if you don't get identity solidified, you cannot form intimate relationships. We have to know ourselves before we can connect successfully, intimately, whether that's love or, or social uh, friendships, platonic relationships. And certainly, you know, for a sense of ego integrity, ego, right, is about self. Uh, and, and, you know, versus despair, we have to get through identity development. I think it's important, especially in this time, that I took the time to talk about being another and how that impacts um, psychosocial development if we're going to talk about connectivity. Um, you know, there's a saying, uh, um, lift as we rise. And um, when folks have been disadvantaged, if we don't all move together socially, we all suffer from that. Um, so as you go through life toward, I uh, wanna make sure I leave time for conversation after, but as we go um, you know, through psychosocial development, um, it, 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 the, one of the last stages is generativity. So this happens, you know, toward the end of life, you know, 70s, 60s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I know I'm 60 in a month, so um, I'm sensitive to the fact that 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 doesn't, it, it's 60 is the new 80. But uh, I do think generativity does start, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, when, and, and we're passing along wisdom, skills, resources, passing love along to the next generation. Is this a compensation against mortality to stay connected uh, and not to be alone uh, with death? Uh, is it a hedge against despair, perhaps? A healthy edge. So, you know, as we move through, through life, uh, um, we're presented with these challenges. And generativity is an answer, perhaps, to existential angst. Um, so, you know, freedom, uh, if we think of it from an existential point of view, is sort of um, the ultimate uh, uh, detachment. You know, uh, in order to be to be to remain free, we must remain detached in some sense. Uh, and generativity, it, it 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 at least from Eric Erickson's point of view of healthy psychosocial development, requires some attachment there. That, that there's uh, joy and responsibility and love. Um, now, I want to separate that out from Buddhism. When, when, by the way, I have a, a joke I, I'll pass on to you. Why doesn't Buddha vacuum his couch? Because he has no attachments. Um, so uh, that's different, though, because when, when there is healthy and unhealthy attachment. And I, I believe, and you guys can correct me in chat if I'm wrong, but when Buddha's talking about attachment, um, he, he, there's unhealthy attachment like enmeshment. So enmeshment is an entanglement of self with other. And um, we, we, we don't, we, we don't, you don't know who is who. And when there's needs, we, we yank each other around. In enmeshed relationships, they're often very volatile, right? Because you must come with me and I must go with you against our wishes. There's sort of a lack of freedom. And, and, and in healthy relationships are more like this. Yeah, we lean on each other sometimes, but, but we're not entangled. Um, and I, I think, uh, I'm guessing what Buddha's talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong in terms of attachment, is, is to, 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 as you mature and, and become independent, that you are not 
uh, you're not enmeshed, entangled, um, that you have that there's a sense of common self that is separate from others um, and can be maintained uh, through a lack of, of, of through healthy boundaries. Um, so existential angst, does life have purpose? Am I in this free fall with nothing to catch me? Uh, versus a kind of, you know, existential angst at its worst is probably nihilism, that there isn't, there's nothing to believe in. Um, and, and with generativity, my life made a difference as I look back. And I've made a choice to connect to the future and pass on. Viktor Frankl <clears throat> wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I, and I'm sh sure many of you know, Viktor Frankl uh, was a Holocaust survivor. And, um, and really his, his book is, a, is about existentialism and, and his survival in, in, in the camps. And he said, don't aim at success. The more, the more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you are going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as a byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. So happiness connected to social connection. Uh, I, I'm from New York and saw a lot of plays growing up. I saw Pippin three times. I loved it. Again, sort of an existential uh, um, angst uh, um, of Pippin, uh, son of Charlemagne, as he struggles. He's, the devil tempts him to, um, you know, go for glory and and fame and war and sex without connection uh, and um, and in the end, he, he learns that, uh, that he, he says, I'm, I'm not a river, or, this is really hard for me not to sing. I'm not a river or a giant bird that soars to the sea. And if I'm never tied to anything, I'll never be free. So the paradox of freedom that, uh, that existentialism raises and, um, and that challenges us, that, that, that asks, makes us ask questions about the importance of connection. So I, I want to um, kind of tie this together um, by showing you again Erickson's uh, stages of psychosocial development. And, and what I tried to do in that series of, um, of photos, the slideshow in the beginning, is to get you thinking about the purpose and the need of connection throughout the lifespan. So when you think about it, there's that umbilical cord um, the most, you know, extreme form, total dependence for life. Um, and, and that dependence is, is, you know, as an infant, is the main connection. We connect to survive. And then we sort of begin to form identity and self-esteem, get a sense of self-efficacy or failure of self-efficacy. And there's this interdependence, a connection to belong to form identity, and identity is formed in a social context. You know, we are who we are um, to, to some extent shaped by our social context, at least in that initial phase uh, as, as, we're, as we are beginning to be molded. And, and then of course we have choice, and as we mature, we begin to make choices around our, our social connections and around purpose and meaning of our lives and who we want to be. And so we form more independence. Now that is not to say that, you know, when we're older, we don't have dependence or that when we're older, we don't have interdependence. Certainly we do. We have those things, but so you might think of it as a, as a additive process. So, uh, but, but really during generativity, the, there's this, I am developed enough now um, independent enough now where I can give back. I can give back. So you can kind of see, you know, dependence and interconnection, identity formation. You know, in sports, there's lots of research on sports, how 
you know, we we connect. Uh, it gives us a, a, certainly I love football, by the way, and I am a Michigan fan. And since I'm the presenter, I get to say go blue. So where's some of that joy? Certainly, you know, we're borrowing. Um, uh, I, 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 can't, I can throw a, I can throw a spiral, but um, I'm not a quarterback, but I can borrow some of that. Um, by identifying with the team, some of that uh, prowess. Um, and then, you know, independence, connection to give. So I want to end my part here with telling you a story. Um, this happened 20 years ago, uh, and it shows you how much it stuck with me, because this happened about 20 years ago, I was thinking last night. Um, I went to a conference and one of the presenters was a student of Eric Erickson's. He was, a, you're, you're gonna think, all I think about is Eric Erickson. It's not true, but it would seem to work for this presentation. Um, but uh, as I was developing this, I thought, yes, I'll tell that story, that Eric Erickson story. So this, this presenter at this main, major conference, he was an older guy then, I think, because I think Erickson was in the 50s, um, at least mid-career mid guy. But he had been a fellow of Eric Erickson, and he told a story about his experience as a fellow and what happened afterward. Um, so here's his story. So Eric Erickson with his, I guess some of his fellows would go uh, and present at big conferences. And um, inevitably at the end of the conference, people would, psychologists would come up and say, hey, uh, hold on a second, gotta have my cap of latte. He would, um, uh, people would come up after the conference and, and present him with clinical dilemmas. So they, they talk about their hardest patients, patients they couldn't help. And, um, and uh, amazingly, uh, Eric Erickson would s pick certain people, uh, psychologists, and, and, and make an effort to help them by going and visiting the patient with the psychologist. And um, he, he listened to one story of a psychologist who had a patient who he'd been working with for years and he was very, very depressed, or she was very, very depressed. And there was nothing that he could do to help her. So Eric said, okay, I'll go, I'll go, and, but I wanna go to her house. Um, so they went to the house and uh, sure enough, uh, they, that, they knocked on the door. The woman was an incredibly depressed, depressed person. Uh, but um, effectually, and and the house was depressing. You know, they went in, everything was dark and dingy and um, and lonely, and uh, except for one room. In one room, the shades were open, light was coming in, and Eric saw that uh, she was in the process of transferring African violets. Now, I don't I don't know the right word for it, but when you take one plant and you make it into two. So he said to her, that's very hard to do, especially African violets. Even I know African violets are very finicky. Um, and so, you know, she said, that's very hard to do. It's interesting. So they, as they're going out of the house, he, he doesn't ask her much, but he does ask her, do you ever leave the house? And she says, I leave the house once a week to go to Catholic mass. So he gets to the front door and Eric turns to her and says, I know your problem. Your problem is not depression. Your problem is you're a bad Catholic. Of course, the woman was probably stunned by that, but he said, that is your problem. So what, what I'm gonna suggest that you do is take one of your African violets uh, and bring it to everyone who's experiencing some social gathering or important moment in their lives. Birthdays, bring them an African violet, weddings, uh, funerals, bring them an African violin. And with that, he left. Um, Eric Erickson was known for finding the bits of light and um, accentuating those, a positive psychology approach, really. And so here's the, 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 the part that gives me chills. So the, this guy who's giving this lecture, his, his old fellow, says that years later, Eric Erickson got a, a, a letter in the mail and opened it up and it was just a, a newspaper clipping. 
and it must have come from the psychologist who initially asked for help. And the headline said, thousands mourn death of African violent lady. So that uh, is my last story about social connection and how important it is for all of us. Um, so now I will, I want to, oops, I'll turn it back over to Bob. I think I'll go leave screen share if I can figure out how to do that. Hmm. Wow, and that was amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, both the art and the science of connectivity, the importance and how we can bring it into our lives and share it with our, our patients and colleagues. Um, thank you so much. You uh, are welcome, but how do I get out of here? Uh, should be up near the leave button, uh, a unshare. In the meantime, while she's working on that, uh, please feel free to turn on your video and ask a question, Cindy. Thanks, Bob, and thank you so much. This is you are welcome. Incredibly, I think, um, I don't know, it just resonates with me in so, so many ways. I'm a nurse by training and um, can remember, you know, throughout my life um, and just reflecting you know, this morning on the number of individuals who have impacted my life by coming alongside of me and by, um, you know, doing life with me and being in relationship with me. Bob is certainly one of those folks. I've known Bob for 20 plus years and um, it just, it's a gift. Um, it's a gift that I've been given, but it's also a gift that we can give to other people. And so thank you for helping us sort of, I think, pause this morning and appreciate and really, I think, um, better understand the importance of it. Yeah, I think I think when you talk about social connection, I I run the risk of telling you what you already know. But I what I hoped that I would do is just provide an opportunity to just sit back and think about it. By the way, did I succeed or no? Uh, you did <laughs> for me. I, okay, yeah. in terms of a screen. Oh. oh, I don't mean in terms of the presentation. I meant oh. did I get the screen off? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Thank you, but I'm glad to know I succeeded. <laughs> oh, here it is. I got it. <laughs> there you go. Now you've got it perfectly. Thank you. Uh, in the chat, uh, Angela says, what a beautiful story about social connection. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that that Violet story was amazing. Like you say, it just gives you the chills. Uh, and you can just picture her opening up uh, as she blossoms and, and finds ways to to uh, share and connect with people. Uh, and Rich said, are there methods or rituals that can be used in the workplace that are particularly effective at providing opportunities to develop social connections? You know, I when I came to St. Joe's, I, I feel like this is a special place to work. Um, I, I Prior to this, I worked at another hospital and there I did not feel it was more vertical, less horizontal, and I didn't feel as connected. And I noticed differences, like everybody using first names um, and uh, folks at the higher leadership being willing to cry or express emotion. Um, and, and the use of reflections at the beginning of meetings. Uh, you know, when people share a reflection, they're sharing a part of themselves. They're it's a more intimate moment. They're, they're saying, this is what I value. This story, this quote has meaning to me. And they're opening up. To, to, and when you open up, you're connecting. So um, those are things I notice at St. Joe's. But I'm, I'm, you know, any ritual that allows people to talk about who they are and their feelings. I mean, I, I think, you know, whenever you have somebody new in your group, Give them an opportunity. Don't 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 just let them come in cold. Give them an opportunity to talk about who they are, um, what they value. I I run a little informal. I I tend to you know I know you're not supposed to bring dogs on. I, I show my dog. I like I like to show my back. You know like show the tree I like in my backyard or whatever. I believe those things are important. Um, I understand professionalism is important, but sometimes it can run cold. We have to make sure that we uh, pepper it with personality so that we can be connected. Excellent. Thank you. Feel free to 
undo your video or uh, un open up your video or unmute your microphone and ask a question or provide a comment or story. Hi, Hi this, this is Allie. And this is Allie, go ahead. Uh, I have a question um, related to identity. I work with a lot of adolescents that have identities that I would I say would identify with, with multiple different groups. For instance, individuals who are biracial, um, individuals who have moved across the country and perhaps identify with different regions or different cultures. Immigrants, I think, are a really great group to describe this. Do you have any thoughts on the what happens when individuals have crisis of uh, aligning multiple identities and how social connection is involved with that? I, I cannot um, urge you enough to read about minority identity development. I just scratched the surface. Um, what is really important to do if you're a provider, to understand the both the psychosocial development of the person in front of you and their identity development if they're a minority. Their identity development is gonna shape their reaction to you. And there, it's also gonna shape their needs. Both of those things, psychosocial development and minority identity development will shape their, we can call it transference or their reaction to you and what they need in the moment. So if you read about it, you're gonna see, so, so when somebody is in, a period of um, uh, confusion, they may not want to have a provider who shares their cultural background because they may see that provider as not as, they, in fact, I heard a story once from an African-American doctor who said his mother um, doesn't like to go to African-American doctors. You know, right. So, you know, she thinks a white doctor is going to be better. And, and, you know, and this guy was he's a physician. So, um, you know, so because we have that if, if we don't get through those stages of minority, minority identity development, we, we internalize that inferiority. So um, so there are other stages where, you know, as somebody is immersing into identity where they may be angry at you because you are white, because you are straight and and you they're going to be watching you for any signs that you are biased and and they may leap uh quickly if they see anything that smacks of that so know what the person needs there are times when you may want us to refer a person uh absolutely where you want to refer a person to immerse in a group um, you know, uh, that engage in politics or do something so they can immerse in culture and then come out of that in, you know, with identity intact and, and rebuilt, you know, that's been beat up by majority culture, majority culture. Um, so when people have lots of overlays, so I would read so you can understand how, and it's particularly complex when you might, it can be very complex, even when, if, for instance, as a gay person, I, I really did a lot of work on coming out and I, and I wrote a book on it. So people come to me often when they were coming out. Uh, I saw so many clients who were coming out. And, and, that, and, and I had to be very careful because depending on where they were at, how they saw me, where I was, it was very, it, 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 a lot of minefields there in terms of the interaction and, and doing the right thing for them and meeting their need. So one, I would read about minority identity development. When it's overlaid like that, it can be even more complicated, multiple identities. Um, always ask people, hey, it can be hard to be, you know, I, when I do resiliency rounding, I, I say to people, it's been a, a we do resiliency rounding in, on the floors. I say, it's been a hell of a year We've got the pain externally that's been happening um, with um, Black Lives Matter, and, and, and we're all seeing the pain that African American community has been through. And we have the pain of COVID. How are you doing with those things? And, um, you know, and, and it's okay to ask. People may not feel safe responding to you, but ask about their lives. It's hard to come out. How are you doing with coming out? You know, um, ask about those levels and be open to what they say and don't be defensive if they're angry, you know, really be open to, to have them talk about their experience. Long answer, sorry. 
Oh, that, that was excellent. Thank you. I, you know, we've we've reached our time. It's clear we've only scratched the surface of this topic, though. So, uh, so much to cover, so much um, information to think of. Uh, and if there were maybe one or two resources to take people towards additional information or study, and then two, how to contact you, because I know you're a resource for those of us in the St. Joe's Network. So I am here uh, uh, for providers, and I'm off the record. I'm not on the power chart. I'm a psychologist. I'm anonymous. Uh, I use something called simple practice. I was hired to be there for providers, initially for physicians, but now for all providers. My cell phone number is out there in the uh, everywhere, but it is 734-657-9034. I'm, it, Bob, feel free to email that to everybody. Um, and uh, just call my cell phone. You can reach me in Haiku as well. Uh, if you want to talk, people call me for concerns they have about home, you know, a death in the family, COVID, uh, divorce, breakup. And I get many calls about half about home, half about work. You know, I hate my boss. I, I can't get along with her. Uh, I, 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 I made a mistake. I made an error. Um, and I'm struggling with that. So feel free to call me about just about anything. Um, as far as resources, you know, I, I again, it's it, the reason why the social pillar is the most important pillar is it is everything. It, you know, it is so much. We are social animals, you know. So um, I don't have one resource to give you. But, Bob, you mentioned a book that you were reading that you thought was helpful. So I, it, the topic is too big for me to think of one of, of a couple of resources, but Bob was just reading when he was telling me about. Yes, uh, it's called uh, Lost Connections, uh, and it really kind of portrays how we think of uh, depression, anxiety as just another clinical syndrome to be treated with medications, whereas in reality, it's about the connections. It's about, as in your final story, we can bring people back to a state of a feeling of participation of, of giving, of helping them to fulfill uh, that important part of ourselves that says, uh, I have value and meaning in life. Uh, so uh, so that, was, that was a good one that I liked. Uh, and um, uh, once again, Ann, we're getting um, a host of um, uh, great accolades for you in this presentation. Uh, thank you, Ann, wonderful, great way to start the day, very informative. So we thank you uh, for all that you have brought us this morning. Um, let me use your cell phone number in the chat once again. It's 734-667-9037. No, 734-657-9034. Did uh, I tell you different numbers? I hope not. <laughs> oh, I, I, I just got it wrong when you said it uh, Six, quickly five, there. Seven. Let me post that in the chat for people. Um, and we'll um, we'll just have to have you back. We appreciate you so much. Um, have a great happy. day in the summer. Um, thank you to all for being there. Um, Melissa, do you have a, are you still on? Do you have a one minute yep. summary of our next lifestyle medicine interest group? Yes, I do. So next month we'll be meeting um, and we're going to alternate back to the 7 p.m. slot. We have Adam Sood and Tara Kemp. Um, this is going to be going after the um, uh, following the addiction, uh, risky substances. Pillar, um, Adam Sue just spoke at the Peapod conference last month. Um, I was in tears listening to his story. He has a story of recovery, personal recovery. Um, he struggled with uh, drug addiction. Um, he was over close to 400 pounds with food addiction. Um, he found whole food plant-based uh, diet, met RIP S system, and really changed his life. Um, so much so that uh, he has now lost 200 pounds. He has been sober. And he wants to give back. So he has partnered with Tara Kemp, who's a researcher. They're out of the University of Texas, Austin. And they're running the Infinite Study, um, which is uh, a study to see if implementing and educating about whole food plant-based eating and healthy eating and addiction recovery uh, can be helpful. So that Infinite Study has been a two-year study. It ends, I think, August 21st. So I'm thrilled to have them on board. I think you will just, um, uh, just be so moved by his own personal story of resilience. Um, and I'm sure we'll learn about connection with him too as well. So um, we'll see you all next month. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks again, Anne. You're wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month. Uh, go forth, uh, make connections, uh, heal the world, and uh, have a great summertime. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.